when Keith came to me about the project that he was working on relative to the history of basketball, you know, we decided that it would be pretty cool to include the Negro Leagues in it because there were so many athletes that played basketball, many of them who played professionally either with the Globetrotters or in some other capacity when we talk, talk about guys like Nat Sweetwater Clifton who was a first baseman for the Chicago American Giants before going on you know, obviously to play with the Knicks. To be associated with the history, to see the pioneers that helped make the game the great game that it is today means a lot. Summer in 1969, Woodstock. Oh, dang. Right? I'm introduced to my first pickup basketball game. This man here, Wayne Dish, airline pilot for TWA, captain. And uh, daylight savings time. For the first time, the world had daylight savings time. So we went from a Saturday morning, 11 a.m. game to Wayne had Tuesday night and Thursday night at 6 o'clock because you could play late. And then added a Sunday game. So from April 15th to October 15th for six months, we play here four days a week. Wow. I often say it's a child's game, but I also say when it's, uh, when it's done properly, it becomes an art form. Include white, black, Hispanic, Asian, everybody into this beautiful game. People were segregated. Jewish people were playing Jewish people, blacks playing blacks. And you won't believe how many different cultures and denominations were involved in the very beginning. The story should be told is something that's very exciting to me. I grew up watching the uh, Globetrotters come to Asbury Park all the time, um, and uh, I was a big fan. Sports has always been the place that transcends color, occupation, political philosophies. So for sure, so it doesn't surprise me that the guy that created basketball was that type of guy. It's staggering, to be honest. It's just, it's just something that Dr. Nate Smith could never comprehend uh, what was going to happen in the next 50 to 100 years. It's an amazing story to hear of this Canadian man who invented this incredible sport for the world. I just remember him as a kind gentleman. And just he's the one who started the game that I love. Now young blacks and whites are playing together in colleges all around the world. I think that it's a story that needs to be told, a Canadian who came and wanted to build a game around community teamwork, cohesiveness. It started with the peach basket, and he was a professor back at the, at the school. I grew up watching African Americans and the Globetrotters. So basketball for me was the NBA and the Globetrotters. It is a natural, the game of basketball, to cross gender boundaries. In December 1891, Dr. Naismith, seen here with legendary Kansas coach Fog Allen, created the game to give football players something to do during the winter. He always recognized that anything that is new is really born out of things that already exist. And I think that's a very humble point of view. He's a Renaissance guy who gave his life to the world to make it a better place. The year was 1936, an Olympic year. As national champions, the V8s had won the right to represent Canada in Berlin. They made it all the way to the gold medal game. The final whistle blew, and fortunately, my father ended up with the ball in his possession. When the game ended, the captain of the Canadian team very discreetly took the game ball and slid the ball under the blanket, and has been a treasure of the family ever since. There are a lot of ways to answer the question of why there aren't 
many Jewish basketball players today. I grew up in the Williamsburg section of Brooklyn, and basketball was the sport. My father came over from Europe when he was a young boy. My mother came from Poland. One in Russia and one in Austria. Russia? Austria. We didn't have a ball. We'd get a stocking hat and fill it with paper and tie it up with a rubber band. And throw it through the lower rung on the apartment house fire escape. My father knew nothing about basketball, and he thought it was a waste of time. To this day, some of the old timers like Hubie Brown calls the game that came out of the Jewish settlement houses, Jew ball. The game that grew out of Jewish ghettos in America emphasized teamwork and tough defense. Ozzy Sheckman, everybody knows him. He scored the first basket for the NBA. A great story here on John McClendon, who a lot of folks may not know about. Not only in terms of being the first black coach, he was the first one to really play fast break basketball. 1933, my grandfather's 72 years old. He's sitting in his chair, first day of classes. He looks up, and there's a young black kid, 18 years old, standing in the door. And he asked me if there was anything he could do to help me, and I said, yes, I'm looking for Dr. Naismith. I, I, I want to be a physical education major, and I've been told he's my advisor. He said, who told you that? And I said, my dad. And he said, come on in. Dad's always right. He understood. He was an intelligent, insightful human being and creative. He understood that once he had black players and white players on the same court, they were all equal. Kansas is right there on the frontier of racial problems. I jumped in the pool and they emptied, they emptied half of the pool when I got out. And, and I, I simply went back the next day and jumped in again. And I told him he's going to have a big water bill in Kansas, biggest one. John went to graduate school at the University of Iowa thanks to some help from Dr. Naismith. Then it was time to begin the coaching career that would lead him to the Hall of Fame. Master planner, strategist, I mean, whether you talk to Clarence Gaines, whether you talk to John Wooden, um, you know, if Adolf Rupp were alive, you know, he would know and, and uh, he would have nothing but praise to say uh, for Coach McClendon. In 1944, at a time in America when blacks and whites had separate restrooms, drinking fountains, and unequal schools, Coach Mack once again tested the limits. I said, we ought to have an integrated competition in the state of North Carolina. There's Duke right over there, across town. There's a university in North Carolina, 12 miles away. There's North Carolina State. I did get a reply from the coach at Duke saying that I could come to the game out there, but if I came, I'd have to sit on the end of a bench and wear a waiter's coat. Coach Mack's a and I team dominated the NAIA winning three consecutive national titles in the late 50s. In 1978, John McClendon followed his teacher into the Basketball Hall of Fame. The style that the Globetrotters had became kind of like a style that started to pervade into the NBA game. Well, I grew up in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and my grandparents would take me to see them. And we had very few opportunities to see African-American you know, athletes. When the Globetrotters came through, that was always a big deal because they were really good basketball players with being pure entertainers at the same time. Whenever the Globetrotters came into town, it was just a wonderful, uh, fun-filled uh, afternoon, but it had, I think, some deeper meaning to it. And sometimes it was necessary for us to travel all night long before we would, in fact, get to a place that we could, uh, we could stay. The players of the Harlem Globetrotters were similar to a lot of black men in that generation. Uh, people with enormous talent who couldn't always show their talent and had to suffer great indignity just to keep food on the table. And the strength and determination of that generation just to survive laid the groundwork for people like myself. Enter Abe Saperstein, a white Jewish immigrant from Chicago's north side. With an entrepreneurial spirit and a love of sports, Sapistine saw a business opportunity. They wanted to play in Wisconsin, they wanted to play in Michigan, and so a white guy would have a much easier time booking those games. The Globetrotters developed a style of play that simply became known as the show. Their approach was so non-offensive. There was a war going on, and the Globetrotters came in town. The war actually stopped 
let us play the game. And then after we left, then they continued the war. The Globe Trotters 1951 World Tour ended in Germany in August. In 1951, Berlin was still totally destroyed. Rebuilding hadn't started. So there were ruins all over the place. The U.S. State Department asked Abe Saperstein to bring his ambassadors of goodwill to Berlin Stadium, along with the Globe Trotters special guest, Jesse Owens. When somebody like the Globe Trotters showed up in Germany, and especially in Berlin, this was a tremendous symbolic event, and it also provided relief. Halfway to the stadium, the road is blocked by young Germans milling in the street. Abe Saperstein, who didn't want to come back in the first place, believes that they're being lynched, you know, that they're going to kill them all. It turns out that it's young Germans there really just for autographs. This helicopter comes in to land, and it was announced to the crowd that this is Jesse Owens arriving, and the crowd just went wild. He said to Jesse, in 1936, Hitler refused to give you his hand. And he said, today, Mr. Owens, I give you both of mine. That kind of ambassadorship helped the image of the United States of America itself. Get up! Get up! Get up! Get up! Oh. So, Cozart, director of Fast Break, see you. <laughs>